This week, I'm talking to my friend and colleague, Lorelai Shimayo. She's a spiritual entrepreneur, a visionary, all-around great person. Enjoy. Welcome to Blue Lightning Healing Meditations. My name is Susie Parker Goins. I'm a channel, so I bring forward your guides so you can connect more easily with them, allowing you to have soul deep conversations with them whenever you want. I'm also an energy healer, past life explorer, a teacher. My goal is to empower you by teaching you these techniques that you can use on your own. We work together to find and identify the blockages to your growth and release them, inviting you to explore your possibilities. I'm available for phone and virtual sessions. The best way to contact me is Susie, that's S-U-S-Y, Susie at bluelightninghealing.com. Visit bluelightninghealing.com for up-to-date information. Blessings. You ready? I am. Okay, cool. So welcome to Blue Lightning Healing Meditations. My name is Susie Parker Goins, and I am so excited to have my friend and colleague, Laurel Shamayo here. I met her doing in-person events. And then since, you know, everything shifted, I have done a lot of her online events. I was working on my calendar just this morning and I marvel at the array of topics she covers. It's very hard for me to say, no, I don't need to be on that one because it's usually, oh, that sounds cool. I want to do that. I want to do that. <laughs> so you'll be getting an email from me pretty soon, Lorelai. <laughs> <laughs> so Lorelai, tell us who you are, what you do, and let's get going. Oh, Susie, it's great to be here. Oh gosh, what do I do? Uh, I do a lot of different things. As you know, I'm an intuitive eye reader and I do coaching also, life leadership and love coaching. Body psychology is maybe the name of the modality I use for that. And then I also do authentic relating and run lots of those events. And I do all kinds of my MIWI events. So metaphysics and wellness fairs and all kinds of other online events. I do matchmaking and career guidance and all kinds of things as part of my eye readings and yeah, just all kinds of different things. I do intellectual property too. Like there's just all kinds of wild, weird stuff oh, wow. that I do. Okay. I, I should recognize that it's not just me, we, you do, but for me, it's the the amount of stuff you organize for me, we, for these online events and now turning into these in-person events. I just think, how can you do more? But you do. And that's amazing to me. Well done. Oh, um, thank you. Let's see. Intuitive eye reading. Can you please explain that? Yeah. So I think that we all read eyes all the time, whether it's our spirits recognize each other or, you know, just biologically we evolved so that we recognize each other. I think that we pick up so much about each other through our eyes. So most people are familiar with the phrase eyes are a window to the soul. So I think that we pick up so much that's unique about who we are through our eyes. I remember when I was a teenager and I was actually raised an atheist, so I didn't have any concept of spirit. It just... I kept feeling like I see so much when I look at people. I just see and feel so much. Not that I even quite had that language then. And I was going the pathway of studying science already. And it just made no sense to me that like our DNA could create all of who we are. It just felt like there was this uniqueness that was beyond that. You know, I've had ideas too about how biology creates our uniqueness, but still soul. So I, I'm able to sense all kinds of traits in people's eyes. I think that we all do it subconsciously. And then explicitly, there's a whole bunch of traits that I consciously am looking at like the angle that our eyes are at, the colored part of our eyes, the iris, the, whether they move, how they move, all kinds of things like that. This is different than iridology then. It's very, very different than iridology. My understanding of iridology is that it's looking at the pattern in the iris and be oh. able to predict health of the body. And I've heard from other people, even some things about our soul from the patterns in our irises and those patterns can change with time. I'm not actually looking at the iris specifically at all. And in fact, if I get too close to the eye, I can't see what it is I'm looking at. I really am oh. feeling more of an energetic presence as well as looking at particular traits like angle and movement and things like that and focus. Oh, wow. Okay. I hadn't made that connection and there's not. Okay. You said you were raised an atheist. When, what, what happened to, to shift your perspective and, and to bring in that, that metaphysical aspect? Yeah, sure. It was, it was a slow, gradual process for me. I, I, we went through science, worked in science for a while and got 
very disillusioned. I really didn't like the way it was practiced in the world. It wasn't, didn't feel like it was according to the way we were actually taught in theory. Not good for the environment, not really in alignment with scientific principles sometimes. I know it can be, and I'm sure it is some in some places. The places I went, I just was very disappointed. And so I gradually moved further away from that. And I realized I didn't want to just do lab work. I was interested in a bigger, broader understanding of the world. And I'd always been interested in people and long story, my family, like I followed my grandmother's ideal instead of really my own ideas of what I was interested in. So I eventually got interested in alternative health, alternative medicine, which led me to just open more and more. And then I was thinking about going back to grad school to study psychology. So finally to focus on people in my thirties. And instead I ran into a teacher that did some version of eye readings and studied and learned everything I could and started studying with somatic psychotherapists. Ended up taking an alternative approach to psychology, just studying with individual teachers instead of going to, through academia. But I think my, my pain of academia from before. And I, I was doing this in terms of leadership first and thinking of it as assessments. And it wasn't until later that I had a colleague sort of elbow me in the ribs and say, you know, you're doing this thing called claircognizance. You need to figure this out. <laughs> That's cool. That explains a lot about the panels that you bring up. But I want to I want to jump back to somatic. Somatic refers to the body. Yes, yes. Oh. So I call it body psychology. So somatic psychology, right? It's it's a psychological, emotional, you know, even to some extent spiritual wellness through the experience of being embodied. Okay, because there are times at events where you give examples to somebody is like that was then and this is now where you put your arm out for the then and I don't mm -hmm. know which That's right. to the left or, you, you know, that was then and then you bring your hand and put it up to your heart and saying this is now. So it's that sort of thing. I, there's also times when you say, you know, when you scratch your head like that. This is that part of the body, which makes me hyper aware. <laughs> I think and, what uh, it can make us all a little paranoid. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, just, just a bit, oh, just just a bit just exactly. A bit. Body psychology for me is it's awareness of the body and use of the body. So in a simple way, just where do we have sensations and how are they often connected to our feelings? Sensations being a route through to feelings. There are certain parts of the body where feelings typically exist, where okay. our body typically sends us the stimulation. It's different for each person, but there are some general themes. So for example, sadness is typically in the high chest and the throat. And so people will often touch themselves there or they'll curve oh, yeah. forward over that part of their body when they're feeling sad. Okay. Right? Or okay. anger. So anger typically is in the jaw, head, neck, shoulders, and back. Okay. So like people that have a lot of headaches or people that have a lot of shoulder pain and ache and, and, and tightness or people that grind their teeth at night, like all those are things that are connected to anger. And I particularly distinguish, and this is where I'm mixing various teachers together in this. Yeah. I distinguish between anger and aggression. So for me, anger is healthy. Anger is yes, no. When we're not used to expressing our anger, it can come out in a big wave, particularly if we have a lot of it stored and then it's no or yes. And as we get more and more comfortable with flowing this feeling, it could be, nope, not for me. Or yeah, I do. I want that. Whereas aggression for me is actually fear. Long story, there are four types of fear, blah, blah, blah. One of them is fight. And so aggression is a push someone down, like take someone down. It could be pushing ourselves down too. So for me, aggression is anti-life. And anger actually really is like pro-life and pro-aliveness. It's allowing our aliveness to flow. Oh, okay. I taught in one of our training panels about body scans and how emotion is held in different parts of the body. It's yeah. interesting to me how it, when you look at it somatically in the body, it's different than when I look at it energetically, or maybe mm -hmm. I've just expanded. It's helped me to expand where I find it. Huh. I say in fear, there are four types of fear. There are all different parts of the body and different. So it, like with fear, there are the four different types. We can recognize when we're in fear from those four different types of patterns that show up. And then there are also antidotes or melters that we can use, ways we can consciously shift our body to flow out of being stuck in fear. So I think like fear is useful. If there's a snake, I use like, I'm going to pick up a pen, like a little snake coming at me. Like it's great <laughs> if I go, ah, I like respond to it in some way, you know? And, um, but if I'm imagining like, oh, this bad thing could happen tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen the next day that I'm paralyzed really and stuck in my fear. Yeah. So there are ways of shifting through and releasing and letting the fear to flow, like feel the whole feeling. And then I'm onto something else. So being aware of what we feel in our body based on sensations we have when we have an itch, usually our body is attempting to get us to pay attention to that part of our body, to notice a feeling, to respond in some way based on the feeling that we have. 
And then body psychology for me also is being able to use our body to impact our experience, to impact how we engage with what's happening inside and on the outside. So shifting out of fear being one of those, or if I keep thinking about the past and I'm stuck in the past, one of those movements of right saying like that was then and this is now and where our body, our arm and our, our leg and also our awareness goes way out to the past, whatever direction that is for us. And then bringing everything in centered now, touching our heart, like this is now what I imagine it's doing not being a neurobiologist, not having tested this, I imagine that it's actually pulling apart the neurons that are firing together, that are wired together and firing together, that with the movement of the body out and in, it's actually pulling those apart so that we can be in the now and not be caught in the past at the same time. Wow, that's fascinating. I just got so caught up in what you were talking about. I didn't make notes. Um, it's great. This is recorded and you too can go back. I like, <laughs> I'll figure out where like, we were. Yeah. So, okay. So somatic is the body. And I, I do understand. I don't think it's a question of agreement, but I do understand that the body holds on to a lot of things. Like in the 70s, it was such a big thing when they figured out that stress is held in the abdominal area. And that was what was causing all these ulcers that were going around. Yeah. And so I find that science takes a little while to catch up with the energetics of it. Oh, it does. I think that like metaphysics and you know, alternative, all kinds of things are so far beyond where science is. And science is doing its part to attempt to document things and, you know, understand things in that way. It just takes longer. When you talk about stress being in the right in the stomach area and ulcers, for me, stress is a form of fear. And one of the typical places we describe fear as being is in the belly, like butterflies in the stomach. Oh. So for me, it's totally all connected. Oh. Oh, okay. Because in, in readings, you know, people talk about their shoulders and it's like, okay, there's some responsibility there that is that yours, is that not? Well, yeah. So, so, so shoulders, look at- I think of as anger, right? Oh. And so if we're hold- so burden, sh- shoulders, right? I should, okay. I'm holding more than I want to hold. And then to me, when someone's holding more than they really want to hold, they're not listening to the no. They're not able to voice and act on the no. So it's connected to anger. If anger is yes, no, pain in the shoulders, right? And holding too much, the burden is not saying no. So all of these axioms that we use, but like you said, butterflies in the stomach, um, broken heart, a lump in the throat. I do understand that those have emotions or those are emotional triggers or emotional. Oh God. What it's it's the way about? we talk about it in common language that actually references the experience in the body. Thank you. <laughs> There's some word for it, I'm sure. I don't know what it is either. No, no, but there is some sort of valid basis, a physical basis for these things and how it relates to the emotion. So I use that a lot when I'm working with folks. Wow. Okay. Yeah, because a lump in my throat is usually where we feel sadness and we're blocking the sadness expression to some extent. The lump is actually in the way. Okay. And then we expand it to talk about the throat chakra and and blah, 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 and all that stuff. So it does help on all kinds of levels. And right. And so lump in the throat. So it's often sadness. And then also the lump is blocking expression. And for me, when people touch their throat or touch under their nose or around their mouth or all those things are often blocking expression. And usually we feel scared, which is why we're not expressing. So there might be something else about fear that's there too. And it does encourage that deep dive into looking at things at a different level as opposed to just the superficial. That's why I love doing what we do because it's not just, oh yeah, you don't get along with them. Okay, fine. But we can dive deeper and say, what about this life? Oh, what about past lives? What about soul contracts? And we can go so much deeper. That's, I love that. I love- For me, it's looking not to blame, looking for how we can be creative and how we can make shifts. Right. How to shift the energy or the perspective or even- Releasing. I think release has a lot to do with this stuff. You know, you're talking about thinking about things in the past. Oh, yeah. Two o'clock in the morning thinking about what I did 30 years ago. Oh, yeah, that happens. And and that is something I've been consciously working on. Intuitive eye reading. Now that you've explained it, to see you actually do it online in these Zoom formats, I understand better how it can work. You've got your intuitive eye. Your thrive types are broken out into seven. Yeah, the thrive types are the archetypes that I use for describing what I see when I do intuitive eye readings with people. So I'm looking at talents. There are seven talents and each person has three and those are most directly connected to our purpose. And so it's it's an essential part of who we are, why we're here. It's what we value, contribute, um, how we can feel the most fulfillment, et cetera. I'm also looking at a person's pacing or rhythm. That's the speed in which they interact and engage in the world, share and take action, all kinds of things. Pacing, I actually look at the rhythm of the energy moving in and out of the eyes. Right. So I can see that in Zoom. I mean, I, people don't know until I've lined up like a bunch of different photos together and you can see it, but we interact at different paces, different rhythms and the energy in our eyes in and out, it matches. 
So how people make decisions, some people want to see lots of options and their, their energy from their eyes actually goes out in more directions. Some people converge in on wanting to find an answer quickly, knowing they can change course. And so their energy narrows in and focuses more. I look at communication where we all use our mind, heart, and body, and how we integrate and share. And the order in which we engage them is different. So I'm think first. I want to know the information first. I want to think about the details first and see how that feels. And then I take action. Whereas someone who's feel, act, think, they feel that they want to go somewhere and they go there and then they think and learn about it after. So the timing in which we take action and how we go about getting to that action, totally different. Oh, wow. Right. So like school, like we, we tend to put people sitting in, in chairs and yeah. that's act last, but some people are act first or act second. And that's why sitting in school doesn't work for them. So having a standing desk or being able to be active and moving while they're thinking and learning. I know there's different learning styles, like there's the intellectual and then kinesthetic, kinesthetic learning, is body. which mm -hmm. is hand-on and and I don't remember the other kinds, but they're so, visual learners, for example, visual and, yeah. and verbal mm -hmm. kinesthetic. Okay. Yeah. So I can understand that. Thanks for bringing that, that example in. And so and I was just quickly say, even their motivations, yeah. what motivates us. And then also oh, those, yeah. those are all in our eyes and we have them from before we're born. So I think of those as our soul and then how we protect ourselves comes from the first two years of this lifetime. It could be other influences too. the first two years of this life. And so like before we're aware of what's happening, just based on our interactions with other humans, we end up coming Coming up with ways to protect ourselves. And then I look at a meta lesson called worldview. And that's what do we define as success? What do we see has the most value? And often people that come to our, um, our different events, they care about connection with other people. Sometimes they're more deeply focused on connection with themselves. And sometimes they're more connected to the service that they can be part of in the world. Just to give you some examples of differences. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I had a thought. Damn it. <laughs> I distracted you and it's gone. <laughs> It, it did. So meta. Okay. Oh, well, okay. So um, we'll just move on. <laughs> we were talking about uh, different ways of learning when they different got Different ways of learning. So, yeah. But they, there in. was something else that. Well, when I read someone's eyes, I'm reading their soul. And my aim is to help them better understand themselves, better understand maybe the lessons that they've come through, why they've been attracted to different people and different kinds of work. And again, so it's getting more conscious about that. So if they're heading in a direction that's not of service to them based on past wounding, based on influence of other people, they can loosen that up, lighten that, do the equivalent of like disconnecting neurons and yeah, choose something that's in alignment with who they really are, where they feel most alive. So this intuitive eye reading, you're, you're able to provide folks not coping mechanisms, but at least an awareness around how they cope and how they deal with things and to help yeah. them, to enable them to, to function or to, to maneuver through life better. Yeah, my aim is like in terms of giving people food or teaching them to fish, I'm aiming to teach them to fish so that they really know themselves, trust themselves more and have new tools for making choices that are in alignment with themselves. And that's why things like feeling their anger and feeling yes, no, is really supportive of being, you know, congruence with and alignment with who we are and the soul energy that's expressing through us. Okay, that's cool. So you didn't start online right away. You, the story well, behind how you got, well, well, yeah, there, there yeah. are two answers, two answers to this. So one is with my yeah. eye readings, I actually started long long ago. I'm one of the early users of Zoom and that's because Skype had really bad visual quality and I had to see people's eyes well. So oh. I started using Zoom long, long ago. I don't know if it was the first year or the second year that they existed, but it was something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then using Zoom for events, maybe let me say a tiny bit about how the fairs got started. Then we'll talk that's, about how they got started. That's online. where I was going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's great. I had to like put in that thing too, though. I just, I love Zoom and I appreciate their quality and that they keep improving. Yeah. So I mentioned that I had this colleague elbow me in the ribs, right? That I had to figure out claircognizance. And that was right around the time when I was moving from Colorado to the Northwest. I think that I was moving is what gave her the prompting of like, all right, I got to just tell Laura Light what's going on. So she did that. And after I moved, I'm like, oh, I got to go check this out. Claircognizance. Okay. Psychic. Oh no. What do I do? <laughs> really? I felt scared, right? I mean, I come to this pathway of being, you know, from atheist and like denial that there was anything that was spirit. And, and my parents, I should say, my parents both came from backgrounds where religion was misused and used to hurt people and push them down and not to support them. And yeah. that's how I was really, it wasn't that I was anti-spirit. I was just anti the misuse of religion. And so my gradual opening, like, okay, there are things that I don't understand. I even know that I could open to doing eye readings. I didn't call it that then, but I'm like, okay, I'm just wandering into this land where I don't quite know what I'm doing and I'm here. So when I got landed in Portland and, you know, signed up for meetup, I think I'd never been on it before. Well, I've been on it, but not much before. So Portland, new meetups come by. I'm like, a new psychic meetup. Okay. I gotta go. I'm scared. Oh, I gotta go. So I went and I think there were like six or so of us and um, like, I guess I fit in. They liked me. I was like, okay, it's not that bad. They're just normal people. I'm all right. And you know, 
they like me and they needed a place to meet. We were at a cafe and I'm like, oh, I've got event space in my house. We can meet in my house. So we met a few times in my house and someone said, hey, we should have an event where several of us share our work. I'm like, okay, I could do that. So I went out and I bought little tables and got a few more folding chairs. And I had this big living room, dining room that was open. And I set up little tables around the room, you know, and did a little bit of advertising and poof, I didn't realize what I was doing, but we had our first fair. So we did that with like six of us in my living room. And then it grew and grew. I kept adding people and moving all around my house till we had about 11 of us all around my house. And it was happening about monthly. And then when I went to move from Portland to Seattle, like, I guess I got to keep going. I got to rent a venue. So, all right, I can figure this out. I can do this. So, yeah. So I figured out renting a venue and I hopped from like place to place, learning what kind of venue really worked. You know, my house just happened to work really well. And then I had to learn unconsciously, right? What was great about it? You know, and what I could do that was even better. And then around that time, looked at, well, I can rent a venue. I can move to another city. My colleague, um, dear Heather, was prompting me, come on, new city. Let's like align the group better this way. So yeah, so we started doing things in Salem and Eugene around the same time. And and I was sorting out my way around Seattle and then eventually started running fairs up in Seattle. So they all started in person before they started online. Yeah. And then about a year before the pandemic, a little over a year before, I just was having this, probably a year and a half before I was having this prompting, of like this should work online. This just should work online. It really should. And finally, I was like, okay, okay, I just got to do this. Like, even if I don't quite know what I'm doing, I got to figure this out. So I had my first fair in January before the pandemic. So we had a couple, January, February, before the world changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were, well, actually, I'm getting this all wrong. A, month, a year before. So it was the January through December, once a month, and then January and February, the year of the pandemic, and then March. Yeah. Okay. We're really going to do a lot online now. So there yeah. were other events I was doing in person that I brought online. First, I want to comment that I admire that you just went, I don't know how to do it. I'll go do it. And you gave yourself that permission to explore. And I admire that very much about what you do and how you're presenting. So I did do some of the in-person events and I marveled at how many different places you had it and how it evolved. And you work really hard to make it a very accepting and inclusive space in person and online. Yeah, it's my aim. And like, I know that how scared I was in the beginning when I stepped into this community too. So I'm particularly aiming to reach lots of people that that really need this and want this and don't even know what it is they need and want and try to have it feel safe and not too scary for them. And at the same time, like I realized that I'm like limiting myself. I only let myself explore so much now too. So I want to include all the people that explore in all these ways that I don't get what it is. Exactly. The point of this podcast is like, I don't know everything and I don't take the time to learn it all because there are other people who know it, who are far more well-versed in these things. And if I wanted to spend my lifetime devoted to one topic, no, I'm one of those like, sure. Yeah, let's try it. And I've learned how to do so many things though, as a result of doing these online panels. Do you want to be on it? (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I can't talk to my dog that well, but I'll try and talk to your ferret. No problem. You know, that sort of thing. And it's been a lot of fun. I just say that's how the event started. It was just groups of us in the community gathering together and sharing about what we do, what we love, what we experience. And we all got to open more as a result. And so the panels, exactly. We get to watch and experience each other, do readings, healings in the moment. And for me, I get to tap in and realize, oh, I had a little niggle there. I felt something. Oh, that's real. Like I could listen to that more or, oh, I feel something about this. Maybe I could explore and open in this new way. So it's a way that I'm expanding my capacity and my gifts while being around each other. And of course, I get more deeply connected with my colleagues and it's great fun. And it's the perspectives I really appreciate. Not everybody has exactly the same perspective. I think if that was the case, then it would be kind of boring. But then, you know, somebody like me comes in and goes, well, I see it this way or, you know, opening up to mediumship. You know, your grandmother doesn't want to talk to me, but it's confirmation though. When other practitioners are saying, yeah, she's not talking to me either. It's, it's confirms a whole whole lot. It validates a whole lot of what I'm feeling. And you're saying the same thing. It's like just knowing that it's it's all, it's such a big, big universe. I did spend like two years as an atheist when I was in college. And then I went, it's really lonely for me Mm -hmm. psychologically because, you know, I would talk to who, you know, I grew up Catholic, talked to Mother Mary, talked to all of them. And then I went, no, No. And then I spent time as an agnostic thinking that there is something greater than myself. And now it's evolved into this metaphysical, uh, metaphysical perspective. And for me, it's a lot of fun. It's it's a why not thing. Why not believe in talking to people who have crossed over? Why not believe in talking to your dog or using external focal points as tarot cards and stuff like that? Another thing about these online events is that it's not only the spectrum of topics you cover, but the reach this has, how far, what different time zones you have to worry about. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's gotten a little crazy because, right, we post events in Australia regularly now. And yeah, I want to go back to something you just said because you said sure. something that was important to me. You said, why not, you know, explore in all these ways? And in my experience, the messages I picked up, or, you know, was directly given was one that I'd be less connected on this physical plane in a way that might be dangerous or that I would lose control, uh -huh. almost like I would let someone else in my driver's seat. Okay. Right? And my experience is that I'm actually more grounded, right? I'm able to be here. Like all the body psychology stuff I do, it's all about being grounded, right? I have tools for staying grounded or regrounding. And then I don't have the experience that I've lost control. I feel more deeply aware of nuancing the flow that I'm on. Yeah. Being more deeply aware. There is so much going on around me and around everybody to be able to tune into it, I think expands one's experience. It's deepened my appreciation for what goes on, that it's not just right here, right in front of me, all the blinders on, and I can only see this much. It's opened it up to be able to see all these different levels. Um, it's actually helped me become more aware of, we've been isolating with my family. So I think it's actually deepened our relationship to be in that deep of a connection, to see their hearts, to see where they're going. And it's, it's not the same for everybody. I love that broadened perspective. It's challenged me when somebody comes in with their story that is different than mine. It's not an experience I've had. So we've had people come in talking about their toxic relationships or the abuses they've experienced. And it's opened me up to listen, to not mm -hmm. judge, but to listen. And then not only to the person who's asking the question, but to their guides around them. And it's not blowing sunshine up anybody's skirt. It's just, okay, here we go. Let's look at it this way. So I, I now see the groundedness in it. Sometimes I think, oh, I'm so up in the ethers. Like, no, I'm kind of grounded when I take that time to stop and listen. Yeah and really connect with them. So that's, that's been another benefit of these events. And then to it's, meet all of these amazing people, go ahead. I said, there's one other thing that arose in my awareness a little earlier and it just came back. And so I want to mention it. It's a, it's a tougher thing. And uh, I didn't realize that I was reading people's energy till like the first most clear way it was for me. And I didn't know what it was I was sensing, but it makes sense because it's part of my own trauma in this life and maybe others too. As, um, I experienced a lot of sexual transgression as a child and a teenager. And I noticed with some people, I could just see them walking out in public. And I just have the sense that someone had been um, traumatized and abused sexually. Okay. And I don't consciously know what it is I pick up in the body, but there's a way that I can see it and feel it. And, you know, there are times I've had some verification, but I see it in lots of people that I can't ask. I don't know, but it, it came up when I was working with a colleague I'm a friend where I was attempting to help him see um, partners that would be a better fit for him. So we were out walking in public and he had a tendency to be attracted to a particular pattern of women. Not only were they different than he is and not a great person for him to be attracted to just in terms of, you know, matching and matching with soulmates. But the other thing is that he tended to be attracted to women that seemed like they'd been sexually abused. And so there's a way that I can pick up that energy in the body, at least with some people. You know, and it was true of a lot of his past partners too. So I think that the people that he was attracted to, chances are like there's some energy they all had in common that I was picking up. So again, maybe part of my own experience and why I'm sensitive to it and can see it. But it's not only the eyes, there's so much that I pick up about people and the energy of their bodies too. I have a shared experience with one of the clients that we talked to. I'm able to speak not only to it on an energetic level, but at a physical level. And there's a deeper connection there. And that's where, oh, I, don't, I don't like the term wounded healer so much. It just makes it sound, I don't like it. But having that shared experience allows one to uh, more deeply connect in a more substantial way, I think, in a, in a, in a, in a hey, okay. for me, it's that we've, having moved through certain lessons, maybe some people move through them much more quickly, more easily, but having definitely spent our time in those lessons, there can be a resonance and a, a resonance to the field of the understanding. I like the word resonance. Yeah. I like that word resonance. Yeah. I, to be able to resonate with somebody, I think it enhances that healing experience. Yeah. It's like also, emp empathic connection. Yeah. But also to be able to listen to. I think that gives us our space. Part of it, it provides the spaciousness, like multidimensional yeah. capacity to listen. That's cool. Um, what else? You were starting to talk about all the different kinds of topics and things that we explore. Oh, God. Yes. Things. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I'm so excited. And, and, Okay, another thing, people will throw out topics to you and you're like, sure, yeah, bang, <laughs> right there. <laughs> You've got it set up. You've got some recurring topics 
you know, the animal communication one. We do. So yeah, you're talking about our panels. So in our panels, yes. there are four to eight or so practitioners that answer questions from the audience. Yeah. So we do them on different themes. So yeah. So you're starting to mention some of the themes we do. Yeah. So we do the themes. Of, okay, yeah. Let's just talk about the panels and the events that you host. The panels themselves, they tend to have a smaller collection of practitioners yep. and it, you pay to ask the question. That's a sliding scale. They can find it on the website. And then I don't think it's a goal, but I think it's one of those things like, yeah, we're going to use say Tarot as a topic today, but generally anybody can ask anything they want to. Oh yeah, that's right. People can ask whatever they want. We give them an opportunity to get to know who we are in the beginning so they can see who they're asking and maybe the same question might apply for them, whoever they're in front of, and it may vary, right? Different versions of the question or different topics may arise for them based on who they're with and the theme. Yeah. Yeah. And, we'll, we'll attempt to answer, right? Or attempt us to be of service, right? Whatever right. that comes through us for whoever asks, whatever they and, ask. And it, it intrigues me. There are times when it's like some topic and, or there, somebody's asking something and I'm like, mm, nah, that's not the physical I'm connecting to. And so I'll pick up something like from a past life or other energy things. And everybody who is at the event, I've seen on your, on your feedback sheets, there are people who say, I didn't ask a question, but I still got a lot of information out of that. Yeah. Which makes me happy because mm -hmm. it's free to listen. And I always encourage people just come on in and hang out. You don't have to, you don't have to know anything. You don't, you just need to be present for it. And that's right, you don't have to be on stage. Simply being mm -hmm. there, chances are you'll benefit and you being there with your energy and holding the space for all that's happening, you're sharing and contributing. Yeah. And those have evolved. You've had many people come in on the, uh, the, one of the questions on your feedback sheet is, do you want to be a practitioner? Some people have said no, but I'd like to learn. And this is where I arbitrarily cut the interview short. We have another half hour that I'll upload next week in which we talk about the structure of the MeWe panels and events. I would love to see you there as a participant, even as a panelist. So until next time, blessings.